you remember the Jesus story of the ten lepers? How Jesus was traveling down from the Galilee, down to Jerusalem, on his way there. And the Bible says, Luke records in Luke 17, that Jesus was traveling along the border of Galilee and Samaria. And as he entered this village, he encountered this little mini colony of lepers. And as they see him coming, they cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And he did. You see, Jesus not only preached and taught mercy, he embodied it, he lived it. And he basically told them, go show yourself to the priest. Basically said, go do the Bible. Because uh, in Leviticus it said, when you were healed, you were to show yourself to the priest. And the Bible says, as they went, they were healed. So they were to go and exercise faith. And Luke records that of the ten, one came back and thanked Jesus. Now, how many of them were there? There were ten. Yeah. I mean, the other nine are running around. They've experienced the mercy of God. And they're running around healed. We're, we're continuing our series through hashtag happy, and we've been walking through the Beatitudes, what's oftentimes referred to in Matthew 5 as the Sermon on the Mount. As Jesus goes up on the hillside there north of Capernaum and crowds have surrounded him. And he begins to disclose sort of the kingdom manifesto of what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus within the kingdom of God. And as we mentioned before, a lot of these uh, sayings of Jesus are very counterintuitive in the culture under Roman occupation. Particularly counterintuitive because if you recall the Romans, they weren't known for their mercy. In fact, as you study Roman history, uh, many of you would know that the Romans would line the roads with crucified criminals, right at eye level, so you could see the pain and agony and the suffering, the consequences of of. Uh, violating the the principles and policies of Roman government. Slavery was very common within Rome, and slaves were treated just as property so they could be abused and beaten and raped and traded and sold. And they had no value. That we know uh, just the bloody games at the circuses within uh, the, the Roman Empire, in which criminals were taken and torn apart uh, by animals in the Colosseums. It was a very cruel culture. And so when Jesus began to talk about a God of mercies and to become a merciful person, it was definitely counterintuitive in his teaching. Even as likely there were some Roman spies in the audience there on the hillside listening to the words of Jesus. It seemed so foreign to their culture. We know, and you probably have studied, about how cruel and wicked some of the uh, Roman emperors were in the early church. I mean, one of the most notable was Nero, who created Christian candles. He would dip Christians in wax and light his garden parties with live burning Christians. Very cruel. We know that uh, baby girls were killed within Rome. Uh, Women had no real value or rights, and so oftentimes baby girls were just killed or aborted. In fact, the physician, Alias Galenius, oftentimes that we know as as a Greek physician, Galen, who was... um, a lot of the modern medicine is attributed to him and anatomy and physiology. And um, he oftentimes, he wrote about, and he actually was a um, physician to some of the uh, Roman emperors. And he wrote and observed that as Romans became Christians, he noticed and observed a conversion among them 
in the sense of their values and their attitudes were changing as the Romans would begin to follow Jesus. They intuitively just stopped killing their babies, their baby girls, and started valuing them. And they quit aborting. There were no Christian laws. It was just in their heart that somehow they had experienced the mercy of God and they were to extend mercy. And here this secular doctor writes in his annals the, 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 the difference. He observed among the Roman citizens who became followers of Jesus versus those who were still performing emperor worship. We see in this, um, in this particular beatitude, and if you recall, Jesus gives these little pithy statements so that on the hillside there, people would remember them. It would sort of be imprinted on their brain. And so there was this common pattern in the Greek of makarioi hoi dot dot dot, hatiatoi dot dot dot. In this particular case, in this Matthew chapter uh, 5 or 7, Makari oi hoi elimones, hatiatoi elithesentai, blessed are the merciful. Those who are merciful to others, God will be merciful to them, or they will find mercy. If you see in your outline uh, a little definition of mercy, mercy is feeling compassion, that's the emotion, and showing kindness, that's the action, to those who are hurting or needing or needy. The character of the person, the follower of Jesus, is a helper of the helpless, and the reward is mercy from God. It's been said that the characteristic of a believer is merciful because they've received so much mercy. Mercy has been described as an attribute, an attribute of God lived out on earth. Oftentimes referred to as the awe-inspiring attribute of God, evidence of our conversion. One of the minor prophets, Hosea, records, For I desire mercy. And this word's mentioned 250 times in the Old Testament. Not sacrifice. An acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. How many of you, how many of you seen the movie uh, Cinderella Man? It's, uh, after, it's a nickname that came uh, for a heavyweight boxer, James J. Bradford, uh, Braddock, James J. Braddock. And he was uh, a boxer in the uh, late 20s, early 30s during the Great Depression. And he was uh, known uh, to, to, within boxing history, as provide one of the most amazing upsets uh, in boxing history. Uh, he he uh, really, at that time, came to represent the hopes and aspirations of the American public who was struggling during the Great Depression. Because on June 13, 1935, although he was a 10 to 1 underdog, he shocked the nation and the world, really, by meeting, beating Max Bear. But what's really cool about this clip I'm about to show you from Cinderella Man, um, and by the way, ladies, Russell Crowe plays the uh, James J. Uh, Braddock in this movie. And uh, sorry, you don't get to see him with his shirt off in this clip, but if you, keep, if you watch the movie, because he's a boxer, anyway, you can say, woohoo. But um, in this clip, uh, you'll see him and his interaction with his son. It's a great Father's Day clip, uh, because I think this message that we have this morning is for all of us uh, ref to, ref to be challenged to reflect the very image of the Father of mercies. And we'll see him display some of that uh, in this clip. So look for it as he interacts with his son. Hey, Dad. Hey. No shifts today, Dad. What are you doing, son? I'm being good. I'm being quiet. I'm being safe. Great. <laughs> Daddy! Daddy! Hey, Rosie Cheek! How you doing? Daddy! Jay Stoll! What? Jay Stoll. 
What's all this about? See, it's a salami. Young lady, your brother's in enough trouble without you telling on him. You understand? It's from the butchers. And he won't say a word about it, will you, Jay? Will you, Jay? Okay, pick it up. Let's go. Do not test me, boy. Right now. How to stay here? Johnson had to go away to Delaware to live with his uncle. Why? His parents didn't have enough money for them to eat. Yeah, well, things ain't easy at the moment, Jay. You're right. There's a lot of people worse off than what we are. And just because things ain't easy, that don't give you the excuse to take what's not yours, does it? That's stealing, right? We don't steal. No matter what happens, we don't steal. Not ever. You got me? Are you giving me your word? Yes. Go on. I promise. And I promise you, we will never send you away. <laughs> it's okay, kid. You got a little scared, I understand. It's okay. So we see the father in this clip looking beyond the deed to see the need. And he gave his son a reassuring promise. Spoke to his security need. And that's a beautiful picture, I think, of mercy. You know, from some of my research, uh, the whole hospital movement, at least that's what it said on the internet, so it's got to be true, right? Came out of Christian mercies. Uh, you know, sometimes, though, in our relationships, we need first aid. And we need to give relational first aid, which is what I think this message is, is about, uh, is giving and offering mercy to others in our lives through our relational encounters. It's a whole lot easier to talk about being merciful than it is to be merciful. I... Uh, <clears throat> read that it's once said that the key to becoming merc a merciful person is to become a broken person. I would temper that a little bit to say I think the key to becoming a merciful person is awareness that you are a broken person. As we look at uh, pursuing happiness through mercy, this is really a, uh, parenthetically, I put in again in your notes, this is really a note to me uh, in my own journey uh, in seeking to become and reflect the very heart of the Father in being a merciful person. So these are really notes to myself. Uh, how do I, you know, here on Father's Day to reflect on how do I really become this person of mercy in my relational encounters with others. I think the first step for me that I've made a note to myself about is to recognize, recognize my own need for mercy. That I have growth areas. And uh, just a recognition that uh, you have growth areas too. Because I know three truths about you. 
although I may not know you or at all or very well, there are three truths I know about you. So I'm glad you're sitting down this morning. But you are an imperfect person. I know that comes as a shock to many of you. You live in an imperfect world around other imperfect people. I didn't give you permission to nudge your spouse or your neighbor. But uh, the realization or the awareness uh, of our brokenness, I think, is an important first step. Paul, writing to the Christians at Ephesus, said, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. For it is by grace you have been saved. Paul, writing to uh, Titus, who he called um, a son in the common faith. He says in Titus 3, 5, He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of His mercy. I recall uh, November 2003. I'll never forget that date because it was uh, just sort of imprinted in my brain. Uh, it was Rachel's senior year, she, first semester of her senior year. She comes home with a $1,000 traffic violation. And I, I remember as I was reading that, um, it wasn't my first emotional reaction, but uh, I just kind of chuckled to myself because uh, who is that really penalizing? Yeah, daughter has no job. So yes, who, who is that penalizing? And I just remember, my, actually my first, if I'm honest, my first emotion was anger. You know, I was just really angry at her. It was November, you know, we had property taxes coming up, Christmas coming up. Uh, that Louis Vuitton purse that she wanted, pff, that ain't going to happen, you know. And, but I couldn't interact with her. I was just so angry. And so I remember, you know, I've got to go... I've got to go cut something. So it's November, and I decide I've got to go out and mow the lawn. I mean, there's nothing growing, okay? And I remember I had to put on a coat, and I'm out there mowing, and I'm sure the neighbors thought, well, you know, he's crazier than I thought he was, you know? <laughs> but I'm out there mowing, and I have this Holy Spirit moment where the Lord reminded me. He rolled back the clock to November 1978. My first semester of my senior year, every girl in the parking lot at Pflugerville High School that I ever wanted to impress was there. And I pulled out in my 67 Camaro, and I think I need to leave them some smoke. I need to, they need to see smoke rolling from my tires. And so, man, I am just gunning that thing, and I'm grinding those, that four on the floor uh, transmission, and that Holly carburetor is... I mean, you could hear that thing, and, and I pull out, and I'm losing, I lose control of the car. I fishtail, and as, a, as an amateur driver, I mean, I'm trying to, I overcompensate, and the, the passenger tire on the back uh, goes off the side of the road, and it catapults me across 1825, and I hit this uh, Camaro head on, uh, this uh, Mustang head on, and we spin around there in the middle of the road. When my dad pulls up, <laughs> You know, his initial um, emotional reaction, I recall, was he was pretty angry. But you know what? You know, I thought uh, no Christmas for me that year. But by the mercies of God and my dad, underneath the Christmas tree that year was a front fender for that 67 Camaro and the uh, grill. And, but that wasn't the most merciful thing. The most merciful thing was my father, in the cold of winter, uh, late December, early January, out putting that fender and that front grill on my car. And I have that Holy Spirit encounter as I'm mowing my grass. And it's that reminder 
of my own fallenness, my own growth areas, and even my tendency today to judge people. The Holy Spirit reminded me that you're still in process too. And, you know, Rachel did have a Christmas, and she did get a Louis Vuitton knockoff. But it's a part of just exhibiting the Father of mercies and becoming that person. And it's a journey. But I think it starts with our realization that we need that. Because I, I, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I tend to sometimes just want to scratch people off my list. Any uh, scratcher offers in the room that want to just <laughs> scratch people off your list? Yeah. Uh, we need this message. Uh, point number two that I wrote down to myself is know and care for the people whom I tend to judge. People are more than their behaviors. Part of the Father of mercies is that He sees that we're more than what we do. That we are more than our actions. In fact, He has a lot of, He places a lot of value on you because of whose image you've been created in. You have worth and value apart from what you do because you're created in the very image of God. You have value apart from your actions and so do the people in your life that you tend to judge. And so sometimes it's an, for me it's a tweak in my attitude, an attitude adjustment for me to go from wanting to scratch them off my list to needing to put their name back down on my list. You remember the uh, parable of the, the ungrateful servant? Uh, Jesus told this parable, and the context of it, if you recall, Peter came to Jesus one day and he said, how many times should I forgive my brother? And so Jesus tells this parable. And that's the context of this parable. He says there was this king who decided one day that he was going to gather his servants and settle his debts because he had servants who had debts. And so the kingdom of God, he said, is like this king. And one of the servants that's brought to this king owes him this great debt. And he's not able to pay and so the king decides that he needs to sell this servant, this servant's wife, the servant's kids, and everything that the servant owns in order to pay back the debt. Well, in the parable, Jesus said that the servant actually knelt down and said, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, have mercy. And in the parable, Jesus said that the king canceled all of his debt. And that's the heart of the Father. Jesus goes on to say that this same servant who'd been a recipient of an amazing amount of mercy goes out and he finds this fellow servant who doesn't owe him but just a minimal amount. And this servant who'd been the recipient of a lot of mercy starts demanding payment. And the fellow servant begs for mercy. Have mercy on me. I'll pay you back. I'll pay you back everything. The unmerciful servant requires that he goes to jail until he pays back the debt. You see, if we've been a recipient of God's divine commodity of mercy, there's a responsibility to share that. And yet, it's not, it's not always an easy journey to get there, and so I'm just trying to give a little bit of a road map at times to take time to know and care about the people you tend to judge. One of the, back when I taught at St. Edwards University... Um, I remember a student, and um, regardless of what I taught in cultural foundation courses that I taught at St. Edwards, they were part of the core courses. 
I always try to teach and reinforce this principle of knowing and caring for people even that you have tension or conflict with because it's an important principle that if you have conflict and you increase care in that relationship the tension or conflict can diminish and so this young lady I remember came in uh, class one day and I just asked her how her weekend was and she, I noticed that she had a boot um, like a therapeutic boot and I could tell it wasn't it must have been a rough weekend it wasn't a good weekend and she said she actually walked into one of those sliding glass doors and just really cut her um, cut her cut her ankle and her and her leg down to to the to the bone actually it's kind of gross as she described it um, and she she said my roommate is just being a jerk she said she's she's not doing anything to help me you know she's not even cleaning the kitchen she's not offering support for anything and she said so it's just it's just been a bad weekend and you know I just shared with her you know why don't you consider trying to increase your care for your roommate again may that may sound counterintuitive but just take that challenge I just encourage you to consider that well I think this was a Monday Wednesday Friday class so she comes back on Friday and you know she had all the smile on her face and I'm like what she said well I decided after class I was a little resistant but I decided to to on the way home to our apartment to drop by and get my roommate a veggie burger and she said it so startled my roommate that both my attitude changed and her attitude changed and she started being helpful ever since she started cleaning the kitchen and offering to help and make my bed and do things for me and she said this works this works and so sometimes it just requires an attitude adjustment in us to really see people I think this is a characteristic of a follower of Jesus is we come to see people as God sees them so we can love them as God loves them and to reflect the heart of the Father the Father of mercies L let's look at this third step our third point serve kindness to those who need it from me God wants me to share the mercy that I've received from him I think this was last uh, this past winter Macy's was having a sale on um, on women's warm-ups and I think they were on sale for like 1999 or something like that and I called Lacey and I said hon I'm gonna get you some warm-ups what what color and she tells me and uh, I call Rachel my daughter and I said Rachel what um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get your mom some some warm-ups they have them here on sale at Macy's and I was wondering what color you'd like well there was there was a pause on the other end of the line and she said dad instead of that I think I'd like you just to take me out and uh, I, let's use that 1999 I'd like to spend that on on food for this homeless person that I keep seeing on the corner this lady she holds a sign up that she says you know hungry and instead of you buying me those warm-ups would you can you just take me out and and we'll spend that money and, and go find that lady so after I woke up you know uh, we went and uh, we went and did that we went and I gave her the 1999 she went in the store she bought food and uh, we went and we found the lady and and she blessed this lady it's part of showing kindness reflecting the very heart of God showing his mercies you know Jesus said and this is recorded by Luke the physician In Luke chapter 6, love your enemies. Do good to them. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. You know, back to the, the story of the ten lepers. You remember the one that came back to thank him? It was a Samaritan. It was a Samaritan. 
You see, even at that, that time, the Jewish lepers rejected Jesus. And yet he was showing kindness and mercy to both Jew and Samaritan. As you know, uh, we go over about every six weeks and do some work in West Bank and in Israel. And one of the times I was over doing some work in Al-Ram, which is um, inside the wall, so it's in the West Bank, but it's only, it's only probably six miles northeast of Jerusalem. And it's a really scary area. Actually, the PA, the Palestinian authorities, don't want it. The Israeli government doesn't want it. So it's sort of an ungoverned territory in Rom. And so we were in there uh, teaching some relational principles, uh, some relation, doing some relational skills training, talking about some of the one another's of the New Testament. Now, we don't tell them that's what we're teaching them, but we teach them that. And so it's a Palestinian area, so we're working with Palestinians. And in particular on this day... Uh, we're asking the question, uh, when is a time recently when someone uh, met a need of yours, showed you some kindness, went out of their way to do something for you? And we're trying to stir up gratitude in the room. And uh, this is all happening in Arabic, so I'm having to use a translator. And uh, there's this woman, uh, she's a Muslim woman, she's covered, she's got the hijab on, and she tells the story about her daughter needing dental care. And it was an emergency. And her dentist in the Arab territory wasn't available. So she had to go into the scary Jewish neighborhoods, into a very wealthy area of the Jewish quarter. And she and her daughter were anxious about doing that. And they went into this gated, um, secure area where there was this uh, doctor's offices and and a medical center, and there's, you have to do paid parking, and she goes in and gets the, the medical crisis taken care of for her daughter, and she comes out, and they can't find their car. I don't know if that has ever happened to you. Your car gets lost in the parking lot. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, yeah, that's happened to me. I get lost in the parking lot. Lacey was the one in our family that has a sense of direction. Uh, but they're walking around in the heat looking for their car. This covered woman and her daughter. Dang, and they're sweating. The meter's running, you know, and they're, they're spending money by walking around. Well, this Jewish woman pulls up in her van. She rolls down the window, and she asks this Arab lady, who's obviously Muslim because she's covered, she says, can I help you? And she said, well, I can't find my car. And so we've been walking around and walking around and walking around, and we can't find our car. And she notices, obviously, this lady sweating and her daughter, and she invites her into her van, and they drive around until finally they find the car. And the Arab woman said as she was pulling out of this parking area, her daughter said, Wow, Mom, not all Jews are bad. See, that act of kindness changed this little Muslim girl's attitude toward Jews. A simple act of becoming like God, and that's an action. And it really helps fulfill our mission here at the Ridge, which is to show Christ. You know, um, I'd like to close our time together just with a little meditation. It's there at the end, uh, toward the end of your outline. It's a meditation on Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, where the author of Hebrews invites you into the throne room, the kingdom of God, and God on his throne. And the author of Hebrews says to come boldly before the throne of God that you might find mercy, that you might find grace in time of need. Now, I don't know what you're needing this morning, but would you just bow your head with me? Would you just imagine yourself, allow yourself to approach the very throne of God with confidence, the author of Hebrews says, knowing, just like Peter said in 1 Peter, to cast your cares upon the Lord, for He cares 
for you. It's that kind of confidence. It's that kind of boldness. And one of the major prophets, Isaiah, in 30 verse 18 says, The Lord is ready to show you mercy. He sits on his throne ready to have compassion on you. Would you go to the Father with whatever you need? Maybe you want to pray with a friend, with a family member. What do you need from the Lord at this moment? Maybe you want to pray this prayer that's in the, in the outline on how to commit your life to Christ. And even if you're a follower of Jesus already, it's a great prayer. Jesus, you can pray with me. Thank you for your love and your sacrifice. I've made mistakes, but I want to change. I believe you paid for my sins on the cross and that you are now alive to give me everlasting life. I ask you to come into my life, fresh and anew, as much as I know how. I want to follow you from now on. Help me to grow, to be more like you. In Jesus' name you prayed that prayer this morning, would you just write that in your Connect card? We'd love to be able to, to follow up with you on your relationship with Christ and how to grow in Him, which is another part of our mission. Not only to know Him, but to grow in Him. If you have a request this morning, uh, you're under a heavy burden or load, and we can pray over you or with you or for you, would you just write that in your Connect card? We've got a prayer team that, that prays. And there's an opportunity if you want to be a part of a growth group and you're not. It's an opportunity. Just put it on there in your Connect card. I'd love to join a growth group, and we'll be in contact with you about how to get a part of that. A challenge on this Father's Day, a wonderful gift to God, is to reflect His image of mercy and reshape other people's image of Him.